When you think about glass, there's an inherent fragility to it. I really enjoy that paradox of glass being this material that can last for thousands of years, but you know, if you bump it off the shelf, it can shatter in a thousand pieces. That's a great metaphor for the natural world and our stewardship of it. I was born and raised out here on Lopez Island. I started working in glass when I was 16 years old. Lopez is a beautiful place and it's definitely copacetic to the creative space. It's super beautiful. Yeah, sometimes we would go on field trips and like find all sorts of eels and crabs and stuff under the rocks. It's amazing the amount of life that you can find in just a tiny bit of water. There's so many different textures and colors for you to see. It's always a great place just to like let the stress of the day wash away. Listen to the water. It releases your mind from everything else. Sometimes you look at something and you're like, oh, I want to make that because it's beautiful. And then you realize the environmental implications and the state that these creatures are in. I really like when there's like this cross-pollination between science and art. This environment is really what informs all of my work. I just really want to capture some essence of life. Glass is just very fluid. It's like a water. It's a liquid when it's hot, and it turns solid really fast. But that fluidity kind of lends itself to the form of the fluid form of an animal underwater. Or, you know, try to capture that, not just a static representation of an animal. Glass is such an amazing medium because it is fluid, but the temperature we work at is like 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty fast, so once you start it, you can't set it down and walk away. It's just a real subtle kind of motion, but I feel like it has that lifelike aspect. You can make a beautiful hyper-realistic salmon, but if it's just stiff like a board, it has no poetry or motion. But if you give it just the slightest curve, and then it becomes alive. Yeah, I'm trying to get that body form just the way I like it. Such a subtle shape. Sometimes the subtler shapes are the hardest. If you just stick your head below the surface and there's this sleek fish sitting there in the current, just moving ever so slightly, that's where I want to take you in that moment. And you can imagine, yeah, if you tried to grab that fish, it would just boom, gone like a rocket, you know? My work could be looked at as a beautiful object, but I hope that it says more than that. And it speaks to the viewer in a way that they feel inspired to maybe protect those yeah. things. And let's switch directions often, just so we keep it straight. Let's go this side up. Now it's alive. Yeah. <laughs> the most powerful part of these native species is that like the salmon has been the lifeblood of the native people for all these tribes. I have macaw heritage and clinket heritage. I think definitely I tap into that cultural past. That's a fascinating aspect of these creatures, both their aesthetic beauty, but also their inherent use for subsistence and what that's given the people of this area since time immemorial. They were catching 150 pound salmon in the Columbia River like not that long ago, you know? And that's a thing of the past. It transcends just a creature and it becomes almost spiritual in a way because it's something that the people of this area have survived on for millennia. 
and it's something that, that the people of this area are also trying to protect. If these large mammals can't survive here, you know, we're drinking the same water and breathing the same air. Take it, Kelly. For me, it becomes it a much up. deeper question about our stewardship of the environment and what the future is going to look like. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. So this is glass that's been ground to a fine talc and it has different metal oxides make the different colors. So like copper will make like a blue or kind of a dark brownish red. Gold will make a brilliant red or a, a golden color. So once we get this clear overlaid, we'll, uh, we'll put a little more color on it. A lot of things are endangered or threatened out here. I did a cane pattern that I'm just trying to kind of simulate. There's like lines going this way and lines going this way. Then right now I'm just looking at this curve and how these are gonna pull out of here. Even these more humble creatures like the pinto abalone are affected by water pollution and environmental degradation. The implications are pretty damning. I mean, we don't even realize how much we rely on the natural world, you know? Like, you could be really nihilistic about it and just say, well, on a geological time scale, an evolutionary time scale, it doesn't make much difference. But I think having a child and being kind of cognizant of our mortality as individuals, it's more about what do we leave behind for our children. All right, go to bed, Ren. Ren, you're amazing, buddy. If you look at it from that standpoint, you kind of have to care. We are responsible for taking care of the environment and the creatures in it. It's not an altruistic thing to do. Our very lives depend on it. Mm -hmm.